This is continuation of our series on solving the mystery of chronic pain and depression. Today's lecture is going to be more about how to not end up in chronic pain and depression and more toward prevention. But again, I want to talk a little bit more. Many of you have already seen this. But this is where the model began. And the, mo <clears throat> the model is turning out to be more and more important uh, as the research continues to accumulate. But it started out with the fact that we were observing a large number of our patients were suffering with both chronic pain and depression or anxiety disorders or PTSD. And in the process of observing this, we were trying to figure out, <clears throat> and these people were brutally difficult to treat. They were not getting better. And if you look at the studies, the people in the middle, basically the recovery rate uh, is about 9%. So I mean, it's random. Uh, the recovery rates on the end aren't so wonderful either. The recovery rates at the end still are under 50%. And so I started asking questions about what this was all about and gathered together a very bright group of people uh, to sit down and ponder this question and start looking at the research and trying to understand what this was. And what we found and what's been evolving out is this whole concept of neuroinflammation. And what we found in particular that chronic pain and neuropsychiatric conditions were both neuroinflammatory, neurodysregulatory, and neurodegenerative. Now, this business of inflammation is a little bit complex, all right? Because inflammation, everybody gets, you know, what's inflammation? So if you have allergies, okay, you have runny nose, you have itchy eyes, that's an inflammatory response in the body, but it's mediated via a specific part of the body part of the immune system that does that. If you get a cut on your leg and that the area gets swollen and red and infected, that's also another type of inflammation going on in the body mediated via the immune system uh, dealing with white cells. But there's a unique inflama inflammatory process that occurs in the central nervous system, and that is mediated by this little guy right here, which is called the microglia. And <clears throat> It's a pretty neat little design because there's only one cell in the central nervous system that actually mediates inflammation. And the beauty of this and understanding this is that if we understand what the mediator is, our target, the microglia, when we can ask the questions, what are the things that set off this target that cause it to become inflammatory? And there's a bunch of things as we study microglial physiology that we learn that start to explain to us how we get sick, why we stay, stay sick, and most importantly, how we can recover. So as we look at microglial activation, and we've been going through some of this during the lectures, neurodegenerative diseases, okay? So MS, we see activation and, dis, and uh, improper uh, activity of the microglia in things like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. But all of these involve some form of dysregulation of the microglia. Infections such as Lyme disease, such as Epstein-Barr, and for that matter, the common cold and flu. When you're feeling crummy, when you're having trouble focus, concentration, when you're having fevers, when you're having chills, you have generalized body aches, okay? The guy causing all of this is the microglia. These are symptoms of activation of microglia. Chronic fatigue is a symptom of activation of microglia. Now, there's a lot of ways that this guy gets activated. So infections is one of them. Trauma. Trauma comes in two forms. Trauma comes in the form of physical trauma, so concussions. And we need now, we understand in the process of treating our kids, and we're seeing our student athletes who are coming in, that this business of allowing them to get multiple concussions is horribly dangerous to them in their long-term health. And that pretty much our rule at this point in time is three concussions and you're out. That's it. No more sports, no more risk of getting yet another concussion because the long-term damages are too severe. And this is all mediated by microglial activation. Toxins in our environment, such as molds, off-gassing from uh, certain um, of chemicals, uh, lead, mercury, these kind of things can all create problems which create inflammation in the central nervous system. There's a variety of medications that can create problems, opioids being among them that will activate the microglia. Hypoxia. Where do you get hypoxia from? Hypoxia is a loss of oxygen to the brain. The most common cause of loss of oxygen to the brain is sleep apnea. It affects 5% of the population. Our best estimates at this point in time is only about 15% of those people have been diagnosed. We find somebody, of all the new patients that I see, I would say easily 
30% of those patients uh, I find sleep apnea on. It's a big problem. You need to think about it. If you're heavy snoring at night, if you notice that your spouse stops breathing, not because you've placed a pillow over their head, but because they've done so on their own, these are the things you have to think about. If you find that you're sleeping long hours, never refreshed, and fall asleep all day long, this assigns a sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is a very big cause of hypoxia. Other causes uh, can be caused in near drowning accidents and stuff. But the most common cause far and away is, is uh, sleep apnea. Ischemia is loss of blood supply to the brain. Loss of blood supply can be caused by a number of reasons, but the number one uh, cause, of course, is stroke. The other piece of trauma is psychological trauma. Constant stress we know upregulates microglia. We know that abrupt stress in terms of uh, assaults on people, uh, such as rapes, also are things that can upregulate microglia. So what we're seeing is a whole picture of things that cause a very common neuronal pathway to get set off. And once we know that the microglia is upregulated, then what we, by knowing this and understanding this, we can walk around the circle and say, okay, which of these factors are coming into play here that are contributing to or causing the upregulation of the microglia? And a lot of things, actually the other thing not listed here is obesity and metabolic syndrome. Okay, so things like diabetes and other autoimmune diseases. Uh, celiac disease. There's a whole range of stuff that will cause inflammation in the central nervous system. And that inflammation in the central nervous system, the problem we have with it right now is we can't quite measure it easily because it has to be measured via uh, cerebral spinal fluid and most people don't like getting taps. So this is kind of the focus and what focuses our thinking at the Kaplan Center uh, about how we start approaching people when they've been sick for a long time and also how we approach people in terms of keeping them healthy. So we have this long list of causes that can potentially be contributing to and uh, creating the upregulation of the microglia. And the other thing to keep in mind that we now know about microglial physiology is that they get, what's supposed to happen is the inflammatory response is a reparative reaction. We want the inflammation to occur because we want repair to occur when damage has been done to the brain, right? It's what inflammation does. It actually initiates the repair process. So we don't want to turn it off. But the problem comes in here is when there have been multiple assaults, okay, when the microglia have been hit a number of times, they upregulate faster and faster, okay? So they kick off their inflammatory uh, molecules at a much faster rate and a much more dramatic rate. Uh, than they would if, if they were back in a complete resting state. The other thing that happens is because they have this form of memory, which we didn't understand until just the last couple of years, one of the things that happens is that there's a point at which they stay upregulated. They continue to fire even though all the stimuli that were causing the problem are taken away. So our approach has to be both looking for all of the factors that are contributing to their upregulation and then approaching the microglia directly and figuring out how to downregulate them, how to let, get the microglia to quiet. And there's a lot of things we need to do in the process of assessing people trying to understand all the full extent of the problem. And the only way you can understand the full extent of the problem is taking a very comprehensive history of people. And our histories are typically about an hour and a half to two hours long we sit and we go through every single system. Where are you having problems? What's your prior exposure? What was going on in childhood? You were healthy until when? Always the question I ask my patients, once upon a time you were in excellent health. When was the last time you were in truly excellent health? And then they lie to me. <laughs> because they say five years ago when I was in the car accident. And as we get into the history, well I've had migraines since I was 13 and uh, I had pneumonia twice and I had one kid where the mother is uh, a 10-year-old um, kid. The mother said he was in perfect health until six months ago when he suddenly develops headaches. Out of the blue, he's got headaches. He was in perfect health prior to the headaches. I asked all the questions that don't last, nothing, nothing, nothing. I go to examine him. I look in his ears, and there are tubes in his uh, tympanic membranes. And you put those tubes in typically to drain ears who have had problems with chronic infections. So I said, how long have those been there? Oh, since he was three step back and get more information. So there's lots of things we need to do and lots of things we can do in order to help restore you to health. And lots of, and, but the goal is 
and the conceptually what we're looking at is trying to understand how to downregulate the infl inflammation that's gone on in the central nervous system. Two studies that just came out recently that I found particularly intriguing. Uh, this was handed to me uh, yesterday by the lower one. Self-compassion is a predictor of interleukin-6 response to acute psychosocial stress, okay? Only a geek could love it. Um, what that says is, as you read the study, self-compassion, the act of self-compassion, the act of reducing stress, okay, reduces inflammation in the central nervous system. Okay, this interleukin-6 is a marker for inflammation, one of the inflammatory cytokines in the central nervous system produced by the microglia. But the act of self-compassion, being gentle with yourself, being forgiving to yourself, is one of the ways that you start the reparative process within yourself. And so that's an extremely important thing to keep in mind because what it means is there are lots of ways that we can help ourselves without the medications, through meditation, through uh, exercise, through our diets. And the simple act of self-compassion is a very important one, and one now verified by studies showing a way of helping us out of our pain and out of our suffering. The other study above this uh, is a look at patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, I uh, sit on the advisory committee at Health and Human Services uh, for chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's a hot potato. It's a very difficult topic to deal with because we're constantly fighting for research funds. And finally, we're starting to get markers that now associate chronic fatigue syndrome. These people are exhausted all the time. If they attempt to exercise, they make themselves worse. And that's one of the hallmarks of chronic fatigue. And this study shows that the inflammatory model that we've been talking about is verified also in people who have chronic fatigue syndrome. So this business of quieting inflammation in the system is critical. And we need to work toward figuring out how we got sick, what are the things that contributed to upregulating the microglia to begin with, what we need to do to downregulate the microglia. And of course, I get to uh, push my book. Uh, the book is officially being released May 6th. It's all about this stuff in great depth and detail. It's all about patient stories. I am obviously very excited about its release. On May 15th at the Sheraton, uh, I'm going to be doing a lecture specifically about the book, and uh, we'll have book signing there as well, so I hope uh, you'll join us on May 15th of that evening. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of uh, Dr. Lisa Lillenfield, uh, who will be talking to us about aging, not just gracefully, but aging well. This whole business of inflammation that we've been talking about are things that age us rapidly. And so things that we can do to keep ourselves healthy, things that Dr. Lisa's gonna be talking about this evening are the things that help keep us healthy long into many years from now. My mentor, Norm Shealy, once told me that he said the normal average life expectancy of a human being physiologically should be 140 years. We will now see all right, president of the United States used to send out birthday cards to everybody when they turn 100 years old. They stopped doing that because we've got too many 100-year-olds. Uh, the fact of the matter is we are expected to see within this generation the first people living to 125. And the objective is for us to live a life such that we're healthy and then kind of drop off the curb rapidly as opposed to this slow, gradual decline where we see loss of ability to move and loss of ability to participate in all of the activities we want to in life. And this lecture tonight is geared toward teaching us how to accomplish that. 